Uh, prior to 2005, I had met Jorge Mario Bergoglio exactly once. Uh, it was 2001. Uh, he was taking part in a synod of bishops in Rome, which is a kind of summit of bishops around the world to advise the Pope on some topic. This synod was taking place four days after 9-11. Uh, the guy who was supposed to be the kind of the chairman, what they call the relator of that synod. couldn't get there. Well, well, no, at the time it was Archbishop, then Archbishop, later Cardinal Edward Egan of New York. Mm -hmm. uh, understandably, Egan felt like he had to go home because he couldn't like spend a month in Rome cooling his jets while this global tragedy is unfolding you know, in his own backyard. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had set up an interview with him, which was in itself kind of unusual, because if you know anything about Archbishop slash Cardinal Egan, nice guy, uh, not a big fan of the media uh, in most respects. Uh, you know, nobody on earth would be happier if you told him you would never have to do another media interview. You know, And you notice in retirement, he's not doing a lot of it. Okay? Anyway, so he had kind of made a concession. He calls me up and says, hey, John, I know we have this appointment for an interview, uh, but uh, I've got to go home. I'm sure you understand. Now, the guy who's taken over for me uh, is the Archbishop from Buenos Aires, and I told him we had this appointment, and he said he'd be willing to talk to you. Uh, you know, do you want to meet him? Now, you've got to understand, sure. as an American reporter overseas, immediately post 9-11, mm -hmm. there's only one story we're doing, okay, right. which is the global reaction to 9-11. All right, so part of me was inclined to say, you know, thank you, Your Excellency, but it doesn't make sense for me right now. But then I'm thinking, I, you know, maybe I can get this guy to say, even in Argentina, we're all Americans now. You know, or something like that. Uh, so I said, sure. Uh, we set up this appointment for the Doma Santa Marta, which now, of course, is famous for being the place that Pope Francis is living. Right. At the time, it was just a hotel on Vatican grounds. But a big one, one where yeah, a lot but, of people would stay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and when you go into the Doma Santa Marta, there are these smoked sliding glass windows that open when you walk in, and then there are these spiral staircases on either side that take you down to the reception desk. And normally, when you're meeting a, a, a kind of big fish, uh, you know, you go in, you go down, you go to the reception desk, you announce your presence, they call up to the room he's staying in, his flunky comes down, takes you to a waiting room. There's a whole yeah. protocol that has to be observed. All right, so this day, I walk in those sliding glass doors. There's a guy just sitting there in, in simple priestly blacks, okay? No insignia of office, okay? And I'm kind of sitting in a folding chair, okay? And I'm kind of startled because I'm not expecting that. Uh, and he looks up at me and says... Lay a Allen, man, which is a are you Allen? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I'm I'm looking for Archbishop Bergoglio. He's like, that's me. <laughs> okay, so okay, uh, and he says, so where do you want to talk? We could probably get another chair. And I'm like, man, you really don't know how this works, do you? <laughs> okay, because all we got to do is walk down there, and there are this whole like retinue of guys in like white jackets that will escort you, mm -hmm. you know, into rooms if if His Excellency wants one. So I got him into room, and then he turns on the lights and says, you know, can I get you some coffee? I'm like, again, you do not get how this works, you know? Um, to be honest with you, it was a fairly anodyne conversation, uh, which was, by the way, Bergoglio's reputation in Argentina. I mean, this is, this is actually why Miracles in the title of the book, because there is something miraculous about the transformation of this man, because his reputation when he was in Argentina uh, was, you know, good pastor, good administrator, genuinely cared about the poor, but from a media and public, projecting a public face point of view, a total dud. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he never gave interviews. He hated appearing in public. When he did, he came off as shy or dull. Um, uh, you, will, you will almost look in vain for a picture of Cardinal Bergoglio prior to his election as the Pope in which he's smiling. <laughs> okay? uh, and that was the vibe I got from him that day. Uh, to be honest, I think I did a 400-word kind of quick turnaround piece on that interview, and that's all I ever did with it. Should have saved the audio. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when he was the run-up in 2005, uh, I assumed at the time that what, what, what that was about, and I think it's true, having talked to cardinals who participated in that conclave, they weren't electing a rock star, okay? They were electing a guy who they felt could get the church's internal house in order, which they felt had kind of been on autopilot during the late John Paul years. Now, what overtook that logic in 2005 was the sense that a majority of those cardinals had that they had just witnessed the end of a historically successful papacy, and they wanted to keep the momentum going, and the best way to do that was to elect the guy who was John Paul's intellectual architect. The vice president. Right? Vice pope, so yeah. to speak. Okay. Now, that was different in 2013 because those management problems had gotten dramatically worse uh, over the eight years of the Benedict papacy. Uh, but that dynamic of a of a of momentum that you just don't want to squander wasn't there anymore. 
So that cleared the path, I think, for the election of a reformer. And so you asked me, did I change my impression of him after 2005? No, I had the same impression. Uh, I've changed my impression of him after 2013, but that's because the man has changed. Mm -hmm.